grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We are currently in our second week of our sermon series called The Christmas No One Expected. We are also currently in the second week of Advent. And if you were here last week, you would, might remember that Pastor Rusty had talked about how Advent is the beginning of the new church year. And we have a picture for you of the church calendar. And essentially, this liturgical calendar, there are six seasons that make up this church year. And it starts here with the season of Advent. And if you're wondering what that silly-looking candle holder is doing in the middle of the sanctuary, that is our Advent wreath. Advent is the season right before Christmas. It's the four weeks leading up to Christmas. And it's a time of preparation and preparing for the coming of the Christ child. And it's a season that is best looked at for its time of expectant waiting. Now, you might also notice with the calendar that there are different colors for each of these seasons. And for the season of Advent, we use and wear the color blue. Now, throughout church history, blue has been used to symbolize Mary, the mother of Jesus, but it has also been used to symbolize hope. And hope, my friends, is a very important theme for today's message. In this series, we are acknowledging how as a society during the holiday season, things can be both beautiful and exciting, while at the same time carrying with it a lot of expectations for folks. So over these next couple of weeks, we'll look at the various ways that expectations manifest themselves in our everyday lives, and especially during this Christmas season. But more than that, we'll look at what God's Word has to say to us about various seasons of expectation and how we might more faithfully live our lives together amidst that expectation so that there might actually truly be joy in the world, and peace on earth. Last week, Pastor Rusty kicked off this series with his message, Expectation Has No Exception. And we looked at how we can manage the frustration of expectation that comes from living in a broken and sinful world. And I encourage you, if you missed last week's message, please go on to our website, go to the archives, and give it a watch. And oh, if you are new this week and you're wondering, why are people eating popcorn in the sanctuary? Well, the answer to that question is because with this series, we are using Pastor Rusty's favorite Christmas movie, Christmas Vacation, as a backdrop to set up our conversations each week. And now, if you're wondering what my favorite Christmas movie is, well, that would be Die Hard. (laughs) All kidding aside, Christmas Vacation really is a wonderful backdrop for this series. You know, firstly... Because unlike so many Christmas films, the plot of Christmas Vacation actually centers around Christmas. Unlike, oh, I don't know, Die Hard? (laughs) Secondly, and most importantly, this movie is extremely relatable. Whether it's intense family spats, aggravated neighborly disputes, Christmas tree struggles, or just plain old financial worries around the holidays, There truly is something for everyone in this film. Christmas Vacation is a comedy. And yet, in this clip, did you notice the music? Did you notice how somber it was? How sad it was? Sure, there were some some little humor thrown in there. I don't have to wear a coat to go to the bathroom. Or making fun of uh, Cousin Eddie. But but this scene is, is really heartbreaking. This young, young girl has no expectation that she will receive anything this Christmas. This clip has reminded me of several stories that I would like to share with you all this morning around this idea of having no expectation. And the first, maybe you've heard of it before, is about the story of a man named Nicholas, St. Nicholas to be exact. Tomorrow is his feast day, and around the world, people will celebrate in different ways. In some parts of Europe, They will hang up stockings and receive orange peels and chocolate coins. Or in other parts of the world, they might leave out their tennis shoes or sneakers and expect to find little toys dropped in them. You see, during the time of Nicholas, there was a rich man who had stumbled upon really hard times. 
And this man, who now was struggling, had three young daughters. Now, with the customs of that time, in order for a woman to be married, the family had to give something to the groom, something of value. We might call that a dowry. And so this man, who once was rich, who now had nothing, had nothing to give for his daughter's dowries. And what this then meant, what society had taught these women and this family, is that if you didn't have a dowry, you would probably end up either in slavery or something far worse. So these three daughters now had no expectation that they would ever be married. However, we know that God works for good even in the midst of bad situations. Nicholas heard about this family, and because Nicholas had been left a large inheritance when his family and when his mother and father had died, he decided to do something about it. So late one night, in the pitch dark, Nicholas threw a sack of gold coins into the house through a window, and can you guess where they landed? We hang this up by the fireplace each Christmas. Stockings. So this bag of gold coins flew into the stockings, some say tennis shoes, or the shoes that were there. That's how we get those two traditions. But this sack of gold fell into the stocking. And the next morning, to the family's delight, they found the gold coins. And soon after, that first daughter was married. Several days later, another bag of gold coins arrived in the house. And then that second daughter also was married. Now this father anxious and overjoyed by the generosity of somebody else, had to know who was this person. And so he staked it out. He waited up all night, waiting for that person to throw another bag of gold coins. And sure enough, when he saw somebody throw them, he caught Nicholas. He caught him. Now Nicholas was embarrassed and uh, not wishing to be known, begged the man to keep his identity a secret. We all know how well that turned out. He said, Look, this is not for me, but this is what God is doing for you in the world. This is a gift from God for you. In this story of Nicholas, we see how these women, this family, had no expectations of finding, finding hope or being able to be married. And yet, Because of the generosity of Nicholas, these women were able to be married. In our story today, we see how Ruby Sue has has no hope or expectation of finding anything good this Christmas season. And this clip is still relatable to us today. There are children in our communities, in our country, and all over the world who will expect nothing this Christmas season. They won't get any presents. There won't be any fancy meals. But, just like Clark, there is something we can do about that, and we are. A part of our ministries that matters ministry is that we do a service project in connection with them. So over this past month, we have collected Christmas gifts for families right here in our area who are in need to be able to celebrate and enjoy this holiday season. At the beginning of last month, we had collected 75 ornaments to get 75 gifts. Last week, when we dropped off that collection, we had over 100 items. In the spirit of St. Nick, let us all give God a round of applause for what God is doing in our lives. Even when we have no expectation We, as followers of Jesus, will always have the expectation of God's good and gracious promises. So this morning, let's look at how the ways in which our society, our world, might teach us to have no expectation, but how our faith calls us to live into the wonderful expectations that God has for us. Last week, Pastor Rusty used one of my favorite Advent readings from the Gospel of Luke. It was Luke chapter 3, verse 15 and 18. And in this reading, we hear about John and how he is baptizing folks and preparing the way for the Lord. I thought we could continue to share John's story this week as well. Most folks know the the cheerful side of John the Baptist. You know, he was this, this Jewish prophet who, after a period of solitude in the desert, he emerged and began preaching and baptizing with this fiery passion. 
You may remember from Sunday school that he wore camel hair garments, and his diet consists of locusts and wild honey. We also like to remember that he is credited with baptizing Jesus. What we usually leave out, or maybe don't lift up as much, is what happens later. How he ends up in a bit of trouble for his fiery and passionate preaching. So while out preaching, John didn't hold anything back. He called sin a sin, and one of the sins he spoke against was the sin of adultery. King Herod at that time had committed that sin. He had stolen his brother's wife, and John was very outspoken about this. He told the people that Herod and his new wife were sinners. Well, Herod's new wife didn't like that too much, and so she had King Herod throw John into jail. His ministry at the Jordan River was over. In last week's reading, he is out preaching and teaching and baptizing. In this week's reading, we find him in jail. The holiday season can be difficult for some. Many people may be dealing with depression during this time of year, even though society tells us that we are supposed to be joyful. The holiday season can be difficult for some. Many people may be dealing with either anxiety or other issues, but society tells us to be cheerful and not overwhelmed or frustrated. Or just like Ruby Sue, this time of year might cause us to have no expectation at all. Now, before I go any further, I just would like to lift up that if this time of year, if this season is hard for you, I encourage you to reach out, to talk to somebody, to seek help if you need it, and to know that as Christians, we are never meant to go it alone. God is always with us, and we are surrounded by a multitude of faithful witnesses all over the world. Yesterday at my drill, I lifted up the same thing to soldiers, and the reason why I'm on this soapbox talking about this is because I've seen the effects from when people don't reach out, from when people aren't able to seek help. So I encourage you all, reach out to your friends, reach out to your loved ones, make sure they're doing all right, and know that it's okay to not be okay during the holidays. This is a, a, a crisis text line that you can text 24-7, to reach out if you have any issues or any problems. And please always know you can come and talk to me. So I'll, I'll step off of my uh, mental health soapbox here, but these symptoms that we're talking about, I wonder, I wonder if they might be describing some of the same symptoms that John might have been feeling while he was in prison. Now, even though many scholars and people credit John as being one of the strongest and most faithful prophets that has ever come, the forerunner and baptizer of Jesus, he was also human, just like you and me. And even though John the Baptist was the greatest of all prophets who came before Jesus, he too probably had moments of doubt, moments of anxiety, moments of depression or frustration, or even the loss of expectation. Living in a broken and sinful world will lead us to experience at one point or another these challenges in our life. I believe that the, the world teaches us in some ways to live into not having any expectations at all. There's actually a, a great quote from one of my other favorite Christmas movies, uh, maybe you've heard of it, Rocky, where uh, Rocky says this. He says, you, me, or nobody's gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't how hard you hit. It's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. Life will be filled with heartache, loss, disappointment even. And Jesus tells us this in the gospel. We see this in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says to his friends, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. So by looking at the story of John the Baptist and what he might have been struggling with while in prison, we can learn a little bit about ourselves, and we can also find ways in which we can find comfort and hope, especially during those times when we are feeling like we shouldn't have any expectation at all. So currently, John has been sitting in this cold, damp, musty, dirty prison cell, and he probably had a lot of time to think. And he probably had some expectations, too. 
Now, we don't know exactly what he might have been expecting, but we can wager to guess, we can think together, that maybe he might have been thinking, I won't be in prison for very long. After all, I'm the forerunner of the Messiah. God will certainly get me out of this prison cell. Or maybe, just maybe he thought to himself, now that Jesus is preaching, he'll put everyone in their place. He'll judge King Herod. He'll judge those Pharisees and Sadducees. Or maybe, maybe he thought, finally, justice will be served because the Messiah is here and he's going to lay down that law. Perhaps those were some of John's expectations at first. But as he sat there in that prison cell, it became clear to him that those things were not happening. Some of his friends came to the prison and reported to him what Jesus was doing. Jesus wasn't going town to town carrying out justice and putting everyone in their place. Instead, he was preaching about peace and loving your neighbor and not judging and that the kingdom of heaven had come, and that the forgiveness of sins had come. This isn't what I was expecting, John may have said to himself. And as John thought about these things, perhaps he started to feel a little depressed. I put forth all that work in the desert, and now I'm sitting in this prison cell, and the Christ isn't doing what I thought he would do. Or just maybe after spending all this time in a cell, John began to have no expectation at all. No expectation that he would ever get out of this prison. And so finally, John sent some of his friends to Jesus to ask him this question. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? I wonder if people sometimes feel this way during the weeks leading up to Christmas. We have all these grand expectations of being filled with joy and being merry, but instead, we may feel a little depressed, a little frustrated, maybe even a little betrayed. You may even say to yourself, God, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do for Christmas. There's a lot of pressure. There's pressure for you to get the decorations up. There's pressure for you to get all the gifts that everybody wants on their wish list. There's pressure to get ready for family gatherings and to cook large meals. And on top of all of that, you also have to go to your job and take care of your family. You're doing the best you can. You even have a manger scene outside, and you're going to church each Sunday of Advent. But you're just not feeling it. Where is that joy that I'm supposed to feel right now? The Christmas carols are playing on the radio, but instead of feeling glad, you feel a little blue. You can even feel as if there is simply no hope. Why should I expect to be surrounded by joy and happiness this time of year, you might ask? Or maybe, like Ruby Sue, because of her past experiences with Christmas, you have learned to expect nothing at all. Is this it? Is this Christmas? Or are we supposed to expect something else? I believe that John the Baptist had those same struggles as he sat in prison. He had all these expectations of what the Christ was going to do but nothing was happening like he had thought. He asked Jesus that question, Are you the one? Do you see, my friends, what Jesus told John? Jesus basically told John, John, throw all of those societal expectations right out the window and just look at what I am doing. I'm giving blind their, the blind their sight back. I'm causing the lame to walk. I'm curing the lepers. I'm giving the deaf their hearing back. I'm raising people from the dead. Good news is being preached to the poor. John, think of the miracles. Throw those societal expectations out the window and just recognize all the miracles that I am doing. Focus on me and God's promised expectations for you. The short answer, though, to John's question would be yes. Yes, John, I am the one that was to come. Focus on me and our Father's expectations. When it comes to expectations, it's not an either-or. When I was preparing for this week's message, I saw a lot of articles titled things like, Have no expectations, and you'll be happy for the rest of your life. Titles like that, at face value, are just false. You know, firstly, because we know as Christians that 
True peace and true happiness comes from God, not from our societal expectations or from our desires or needs or wants, but from God. And second, because when we have no expectation, that doesn't leave us with any hope. When we have too high of an expectation and we get let down, we can crash really, really hard. And it might also hurt those around us. But the same thing goes when we decide to have no expectation at all. So then, what does God's word have to say about this? In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, we read this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you, say it with me, hope and a future. Remember, I said hope was going to play an important role today. Hope, my friends, is the expectation of something desired. It is a trust and a confidence. And for us, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we have faith. This is what the book of Hebrews chapter 11 has to say about faith and what it is. Now, faith is confidence and what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Martin Luther said that our faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. Expectations carry with them a selfish slant filled with desires of self-fulfillment even when we think they don't. That is why as Christians we are called to focus on and live into God's expectations for us. And we confess and believe that as followers of Christ that God is the source of goodness and that everything God desires for us is good. That is our expectation. Hope and desire are the fuel of living passionately. When rightly placed, they release God's intention into the world around us. It is God who gives us the ability to dream and the courage to dream again when dreams seem lost. As Christians, we are called to live into the hopeful expectation of the promises that through Christ, the door to everlasting life has been opened for us. We didn't earn any of God's promises. But as Christians, when we live into our faith, we live into these expectations that God has in store for us. As Christians, we are called to always have these expectations. In the world, we will have trouble. Jesus told us this. We may have grand expectations of things in the world, or like Ruby Sue, we may have no expectations at all. For me, while preparing for this sermon, I was thinking of, of ways in which, in my own life, I have lived with no expectation. One of the first things that came to mind is that when I travel once a month down to Houston, I have no expectation that I will make it to Houston in less than four hours on a Friday afternoon. It just won't happen. Now, if you, you don't live in this area and you, you don't know that drive, here's, here's maybe one that's a little more relatable for everyone. Staff meetings. Not here at church for me, but for my once a month army call that I have to get on each month, they always say, oh, it'll be less than an hour. We don't have much to talk about. Somebody always has something to talk about. So my expectation is that it, it will always take longer than an hour, and I will have no expectation that it will get done before that. And my friends, even when we have no expectations in those situations, in those worldly situations, as followers of Jesus, we are always to live into God's expectation. Because Jesus also told us that he has overcome the world. There's actually a one more man's story of being imprisoned that I would like to share with you all this morning. This man's name is uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran pastor during the 1930s and 40s, and he was German. And he actually came over to America in the 30s to preach and to teach and to work. Now, if we remember our history lessons during the 30s was Hitler's rise to power in Germany, and Bonhoeffer saw this, and he had the choice. He could either stay in America or he could go back to Germany, and he made the choice to go back to Germany. Talk about pastor goals, y'all. That's really courageous. That's brave. He didn't have to go back, but he decided to. He decided to act on his faith, and so he went back to Germany to stand up to the evils of the Nazi regime, and ultimately, that led to his imprisonment for speaking out against the Nazi party. And just like John, they both spent the rest of their days in a prison cell until they were executed. 
Now, before Bonhoeffer died, he had sent letters to loved ones and friends, and in one of those letters, this is what he has to say about the season of Advent. He says, A prison cell like this is a good analogy for Advent. One waits, hopes, does this or that, ultimately negligible things. The door is locked and can only be opened from the outside. This comparison between Advent and prison may seem strange or or even a little bleak. However, I believe it also lifts up the ideas of two themes for this season of Advent. The theme of powerlessness or even hopelessness. And Dietrich believed that this is the particular time of year where we can actually live into those as we prepare for the coming of Christ. Celebrating this season of Advent is to prepare us to live as people who have made a transformation with the present world of sin and death and are also preparing for the redeemed future, that expectation that God has already, in one sense, accomplished. Through Advent, we learn how to live into these realities. We have already been delivered, and yet our deliverance is still to come. As Christians, we still have the beautiful and life-altering expectations of God's promises. Through our faith in a good and gracious God, we are called to live into that expectation that Christ is coming to rescue us from the prison cells of our lives, of our existence, from our anxieties, from our sins, from our loneliness. Our faith calls us to live into this expectation, but then how do we wait? Bonhoeffer identifies Christians with the servants in the Gospel of Luke chapter 12 who keep their lamps burning while waiting for the bridegroom, waiting for Christ to return. Because we know that Christ will come. Our waiting is not passive or resigned. Rather, like Mary, Joseph, and the wise men, we learn to wait actively for God's promises to be fulfilled. Expectation and faith go together. The commonality between the two is action. Action is the thing that brings expectation and faith together. When we act on faith, we are not simply passively throwing our hands up and saying, God will fix that. We put our faith into action. We act through prayers by making a conscious effort to communicate with loved ones, pastors, church leaders, friends. We speak truth and hear truth be spoken to us. We expect that by doing so, we can trust and a God that delivers on God's promises. We can expect that when we seek God, God is here. We can expect that God is supreme, that God is omnipresent, and we expect that our true belief in Jesus Christ, our Savior, will lead us out of our difficult trials and tribulations. We expect to be servants of Christ, to lead by our faith. We expect to walk with Jesus, and because of his atoning works on the cross, we expect to die in his name and also be raised again. When the expectations of the season become too much or even to the point of no longer having any expectations, turn your focus on him. Although the whole point of the season is truly all about Jesus, we can sometimes forget that. Everyone's very busy this time of year, very busy trying to avoid the real point of the season. Shopping will take place, parties will be thrown, lots of cookies will be eaten. And think of all these Christmas cards that get sent out. There's there's pictures of birds, there's, you know, stockings hung by an open fire, there's snow, but everything but Jesus. So what is the point of it, y'all? You can listen to the sounds of dogs barking to the tune of jingle bells. You can can rush and hurry, but what is the point of it all? Why are we doing all this? Without Christ, you get these high expectations of how happy you'll be. But then, as you're going through Christmas, and especially when it's over, you realize, this isn't what I expected. Christmas happened because there was sin in the world. The reason Christmas happened was because Jesus came to take away our sin. That is, in my opinion, the point of Christmas. And I encourage you over these next couple of weeks to stay grounded and fixed on Christ. 
Just think of what God has done for us all. Carve out that time to read God's word. I'd lift up maybe, maybe reading the birth narrative. You can find it in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. And we'll put that up on the screen for you if you'd like to be able to write that down to read later. I would also encourage you to use this active faith in your community. Maybe that means reading Christmas stories to children at the library, serving at a soup kitchen, volunteering with the CCA. Last week, Pastor Rusty had lifted up the tragedy of the Christmas parade that occurred in Wisconsin. This week, I'd like to share with you all a little, a little bit of good news. Uh, it was reported on this past Wednesday that J.J. Watt, a professional football player, has offered to pay the funeral expenses for all those who are killed by that driver. There are many ways in which we can serve our neighbor, and a part of having this act of faith, we are to serve our neighbor. But God doesn't need our good works, but those around us do. And there are many ways in which we can do that. God has given us all good things, our time, our talents, and our treasures. And we can be intentional about the ways over these next couple of weeks that we can utilize them to serve one another. And when we do serve one another, when we help somebody out, we truly do come face to face with God. When you recognize those miracles of Christ and focus on that, suddenly all the hustle and bustle of Christmas is a little bit easier. The birth of Christ, that's worth decorating for. God becoming human, that's worth having a family gathering. That God would become a man to take away my sins, that is worth turning my entire life upside down for. When you recognize what's really important, what the real miracles of Christmas are, when you stop focusing on all of those expectations or lack thereof, and instead just focus on Christ and what he has done, then this whole Christmas season starts to become a little more enjoyable. I wonder how John the Baptist liked the answer he received from Jesus. Yes, John, I am the one. Look at the miracles. I wonder if that good news changed his expectation. Take some time over the next couple of weeks and ponder all the miracles that Jesus has done for you in the past, right now in your life, and what he will continue to do for you in the future. Focus on that. Take heart in that and know that as we have faith in Christ and we are assured of God's hope and promises for us, and in those promises we will find joy, peace, love, and grace. In life, society may teach us to have no expectation at all, but our faith in God assures us of God's promises, and that is truly the only expectation we need. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we give you thanks for this morning of worship, for this opportunity to gather in your name and to sing your praises. As we come into the second week of Advent, help to set our hearts and focus on what is most important your coming. Help us to remember how we can serve our neighbor, to love one another, to use these good gifts that you have given us. I ask this day that you especially help all those who might be struggling, for all those who might be having extreme anxiety or going through depression, that we as faithful witnesses might be able to reflect your love to them, that we might be able to help one another and lift one another up. And when we do this, we know that we come face to face, heart to heart with you, O oh God. I ask that you continue to guide us and lead us and help us as we prepare for your advent. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.